Okay. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, it's a very distinguished audience and I hope to convince you that uh, uh, some of my work makes sense. Um, because I come from a physics background and I try to leverage that and uh, in, um, in this quantum computation context where you would want to maybe prepare some states and um, I want to use many body quantum theory for that. So, okay. Um, let me introduce quickly and motivate uh, why and uh, what does this have to do with. So, I mean, preparing many body states uh, just some designated target states in quantum hardware is obviously challenging. It's challenging on classical hardware, uh, where it's exponentially hard in general, but on quantum hardware, it's also not so trivial. And uh, also, it has crucial use cases, uh, such as uh, measurement-based computations, where you need to prepare cluster states first, or you can study states on their own, which would represent then low-energy physics. Uh, or maybe you can solve classical optimization problems. So here I want to focus on entangled target states, which is a bit of broad, a broad umbrella, which in, in particular excludes classical, uh, classical optimization problems, which would typically would be presented by uh, computational basis states as outputs uh, or as uh, answers or proofs. And um, uh, these are still most of the most of the interest still lies in kind of simulating such entangled states and they're again most challenging to prepare this relates the uh, presence of entanglement is related physically to the interactions in the system hamiltonian uh, for example if you want the ground state of an interacting hamiltonian then the ground state will probably be an entangled state uh, as opposed to if you have a single just uh, no interactions at all uh, or if you perform evolution, then interactions result in entanglement. And uh, for this reason, of course, there are deep connections with uh, just many body physics. And uh, that's what I mean by many body quantum theory, the theoretical physics of many body, uh, yeah, of, of many body physics. Okay, cool. So, and uh, some pro state, pro uh, state preparation protocols were drawn from there. And uh, I want to give you some examples from my own work. And uh, this is going to be a, a like a rough overview of three uh, very different approaches, and uh, can be just uh, to anticipate can be roughly called uh, uh, referred to as rigorous variational uh, ansatz circuits. So you may have heard of variational quantum algorithms, and that involves ansatzes and how to build rigorous ones. It's a question, and. Um, digital quantum cooling where you kind of use the ideas from quantum cooling and sort of quantum thermodynamics to or sort of thermodynamics to um you to have digital quantum algorithms and finally a little bit of a flavor of quantum control theory but again that links back to um to uh, many body physics where we try to navigate Hilbert space with weak measurements, which I call measurement-driven navigation of the Hilbert space towards, again, some target states that are useful. And I finally wrap up with uh, what's ongoing and what's next. I don't know, it's a little bit of an explicitly a job kind of talk. So, <laughs> so it's, it's going to be a little bit of an overview. So, and, okay, cool. So let me tell you first the first example. Uh, rigorous uh, variational ansatz circuits. So you may have heard of variational quantum algorithms, and this is uh, something that people do in the uh, near term. I mean, they already do on put, uh, put such algorithms on quantum devices, and they hope that before we hit the full tolerance, we'll may be able to extract some use from, from this particular uh, family of algorithms, I should say. So the goal would be to find the ground state of some target Hamiltonian, um, and the approach is you have some ansatz circuit, which is a parameterized quantum circuit uh, where you have angles and you can tune those angles. And uh, by tuning those angles, you change the output state. And uh, you can measure the Hamiltonian at the end of, of, your, of your circuit by uh, basically performing partial tomography, uh, for instance. And um, uh, then you can turn off your quantum computer and go home, uh, figuratively speaking, in the sense that you don't need to keep coherence, you can just store the energy that you output it, and again, uh, kind of, you lose all coherence, but doesn't matter, you reset the, the quantum computer, and then you run again, and uh, you modify the parameters, you tune the parameters of the circuit, uh, and this way you get closer and closer to the target state, hopefully. 
uh, which is the ground state in this case. So, and in, in my opinion, kind of a strong opinion that uh, here it still matter because we are doing quantum computation, it matters a lot what circuit we actually use. And people often ignore it. They kind of take it for granted that actually the circuit we are using is able to prepare anything that would that would hopefully lie outside of classical simulability domain, right? Because otherwise, why would you use a quantum computer? So, but it's uh, not a given at all. And uh, give, for any for arbitrary Hamiltonian, if you just choose an arbitrary ansatz, I mean, there are even formal statements that tell you that no, you're not going to give any advantage. You're not going to get any advantage, and that's not surprising because you can only have polynomially many parameters in the circuit. It's not clear which gates you should even choose. So this is what I'm going to focus on. I'm not going to even to think about any errors or kind of measurement costs or anything like that. Just the question of what could be a good choice for the circuit here so that we can hope uh, for some efficient uh, parameterization of the, of the Hilbert space. And the approach uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to present, is that um, a little bit of a formal top-down approach where uh, basically kind of inspired from some of the methods that are in classical uh, kind of approximation for quantum anybody physics like tensor networks. The very nice property that especially mathematically minded people like is that, um, well, in principle, if you increase bond, so-called bond dimension of the tensor network, you would go to, uh, to in, you could cover the entire Hilbert space in principle, for example, if you do it in the matrix product state. And this is just something that is nice to have in your uh, in your approach. So in principle, it has the, the capacity to reach arbitrarily small precision, um, arbitrarily high precision to, to the target state in principle. And uh, that's something I would start from. I would give uh, construction for the ansatz. It is able to cover, in principle, the entire Hilbert space. Of course, there's going to be exponentially large and there's exponentially many parameters. But then uh, the next step is to reduce that ansatz to be able to have a reduction scheme that, uh, given a Hamiltonian, tells you which gates from this ansatz are going to be most relevant for this um, for this um, Hamiltonian. And that hopefully there is a match between this template parent ansatz that you start from that covers the entire Hilbert space here. just. Uh, uh, schematically depicted by a big box and uh, uh, the capacity of uh, just choosing some specific parameters uh, theta from uh, from this uh, from this ansatz and getting closer uh, getting expecting to be relatively close to the ground state uh, after the optimization so okay so that's the general approach and let me tell you the specific solution um, there is um, basically a and that's something that I basically didn't exist before. Um, the question is, can you write down a sequence of maybe kind of two to the n circuits? Uh, it will be two to the n minus one if you want to represent the entire real Hilbert space and two to the n minus one times two if you want to re represent the entire Hilbert space. So that's the number of gates, I'm sorry, that you, that you need. Um, if, if each has single parameter. Uh, that would be kind of a digital digital quantum uh, representation because those need to be separate gates. And um, can you have that such that your entire Hilbert space is exactly parameterized? So here's a solution to that, to this problem, um, where you can go and prove things by induction. First, I have to explain to you what the gates are. I mean, basically, it's a bit of a condensed notation. And if you have, let's say, a... Uh, a, a box with a uh, letter X somewhere in the box with a letter Y somewhere that corresponds to a generator of a rotation with some specific angle theta that you can tune however you want. And, <clears throat> and this would be one of the elements. So here you have seven gates, seven separate gates. And um, <clears throat> and uh, that uh, that is seven independent parameters, which is two to the three minus one. Uh, so that covers entire real uh, three qubit space, actually. And you can prove by induction by first proving that the first qubit Hilbert space is covered, but then adding these uh, two extra gates and proving that this two qubit Hilbert space is covered. And then finally adding the last layer. And you can go on like this, and you can also extend this to complex, uh, to complex Hilbert space, um, uh, basically in a very similar way. So, uh, so this is a, uh, this is a, 
um, this kind of template parent ansatz. And uh, what seems good about it is that many gates here seem to be irrelevant. Like if you would continue this construction, you would have this very many, like um, this, uh, this gates involve really a lot of qubits. And uh, hopefully those are not physically relevant. Uh, so you will end up with a relatively small number of qubits while having a guarantee that actually if you would include all of those irrelevant qubits, you would even cover the entire Hilbert space. So that kind of uh, looks, looks, uh, looks good. Uh, but what would be the proof? Uh, how can you prove that you have an effective scheme for reduction? So uh, taking this example of a three qubit system, uh, although of course this is completely scalable and can be proven, for and can be designed for any for for any arbitrary system size. Uh, the scheme, if you have this particular target model, would be like this: uh, that the dark blue gates are the most important ones to include. They cover the most relevant part of the Hilbert space that get the most. The, they allow you to get closest to the um, to the target state if you were to choose any two gates. And uh, then this uh, light blue would be the second most important, and the red ones will never appear. And uh, the, they will never appear actually for symmetry reasons, but this uh, reduction scheme uh, that is actually based on perturbation theory, uh, as I will tell you in a second, uh, throws them out automatically. So uh, this uh, you can know that this Hamiltonian has a parity conservation symmetry, meaning that um, basically if you flip um, if you flip uh, an odd number of qubits, uh, that's going to take you out of the symmetry block of this Hamiltonian. So. Um, yes, and this is a transverse field Ising model, so-called. Okay, so how does one arrive at picture like this with this kind of priority scheme? And uh, again, with this simple example here. Um, okay, so basically, if uh, you have uh, if you have physics background, then you uh, will probably learned a whole lot of uh, things like Feynman diagrams in your undergrad, or maybe you have heard of them, even if you have computer science background. But um, here the the Feynman diagrams or kind of the diagrammatic technique for many body perturbation theory is slightly different because it's dealing now with the n-body spin uh, system. So you have to a little bit redesign it, but it's possible. And the idea is that basically you have these two terms, two terms that are acting like perturbation in the Hamiltonian. And these two terms can excite uh, in the perturbation theory, they, they can excite uh, the, rel the respective qubits. For example, the x1, x2 can excite the first two qubits and create a respective term perturbation theory. x2, x3 can flip the second and third qubit. And uh, this can be represented by these diagrams here, where you have this two-legged uh, two unit that excites, uh, goes from empty, um, empty uh, circle to the field circle. Um, that flips, uh, therefore, these two qubits. And this corresponds to an action of the x1, x2 perturbation. And this would correspond then to the fact that you need to include this xy rotation in the circuit. Uh, Sorry, can I ask a question? So the unimportant gates are unimportant for the ground state preparation for yes. or, or, or anything? Okay. For, for they, they are unimportant specifically for the ground state preparation of this Hamiltonian. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Because in principle, if you would have a different Hamiltonian, then the picture here would be entirely different how you choose. Because this, in principle, covers the entire Hilbert space. But then how you choose between gates is a different story. Yep. Um, then uh, if you have a second order uh, perturbation theory term, uh, which would be proportional to the product of these two flips, um, then uh, that would actually uh, flip only the first and the third qubit, and the second qubit will flip twice, so it go back to nothing. And uh, this corresponds to a rotation also on the first and the third qubit that would uh, slightly excite them because it's a, it's an angle. You see, it's a x it's a rotation generated by x y, but it can be a rotation with a small angle, and that that's what it actually would, will be. Um, and then this corresponds directly to this diagram. And when I say corresponds, it's actually uh, a particular theorem that you can prove that the perturbation theory um, uh, will be exactly solved uh, by this uh, circuit ansatz. Uh, you can exactly find the parameters for thetas. You can solve those equations actually in a trivial way, although they're nonlinear, but they just have a very nice structure thanks to the structure of the this parent ansatz. So this is like a lucky coincidence or a lucky 
kind of collab collaboration between the parent answers and this perturbation theory that allows you to have to solve perturbation theory exactly with the answers. And then, of course, you want to go beyond perturbation theory because um, this is a variational uh, algorithm. You want to do something beyond classical, uh, but that is basically yeah i mean if you have a, uh, a quantum circuit that reproduces perturbation theory up to given order then it will be uh it will be polynomially large but its capacity of course will be much bigger than perturbation theory itself so you hope that uh, on the one hand it reproduces something physically meaningful and uh, analytically precise on the other hand it has now more capacity than that so you can you can go uh, and produce something that is more relevant so and uh, potentially beyond classical so, okay, so this also corresponds, like if you ever heard of this variational uh, quantum algorithm business, then you heard of this unitary coupled cluster answers that are used from the beginning. And uh, actually uh, at the very foundation back in the fifties, when these kind of coupled cluster answers were uh, designed, uh, they were also based on this kind of principle where you link uh, the, uh, essentially the parameters of the variational uh, answers two connected diagrams, but then somehow over time it got forgotten a little bit and people kind of, they lost this, uh, they lost this basis to, especially now when they apply to quantum algorithms, uh, they basically uh, ignore all high order diagrams and just focus on the low order uh, stuff, which uh, I think is, is not really faithful if you want to reproduce uh, higher, basically strongly interacting uh, systems they have perturbations here that is kind of focused on higher order. So I don't think this is a good idea, but okay. So here's at least something that has this mathematical property finally. Okay, so, okay. The special thing about this ANSYS is that it suggests to use slightly non-local gates, not entirely non-local, but at least they, for example, this one that jumps over two. So it kind of the, the support of these gates, it kind of grows as you go higher in, in the perturbation theory order, which is quite contrary to what people have been suggesting so far. Uh, and uh, the question is, can you actually show that this, is, this has any benefit whatsoever, uh, maybe in practice numerically? And actually it checks out what, uh, what the, yeah, analytics says with a slight additional twist. The analytics would tell you that, yeah, it's a good idea as far as you weakly couple. And the numerics told us that we did uh, on the on a bunch of spin chains like uh, the um, the transfer fieldizing, but also the Heisenberg and the XY model in external field uh, tells you that basically if you stay in this inside the same phase in the domain of same phase where you started your perturbation theory, you're fine even if your coupling is strong. So then uh, this answer still outperforms the alternatives, which would be to actually, um, which would be to uh, use only nearest neighbor uh, terms. But if you cross the phase transition point, then this nearest neighbor, the, the, uh, the more agnostic answers that don't use all this perturbation theory and this kind of physical reasoning, uh, they can uh, outperform you in principle, but it's not clear if their performance will be, uh, will be uh, partic particularly good. Uh, so uh, then you need kind of additional analytical reasons why it works. And for instance, here, there is a secret reason why this particular answers works, which actually is, un which is different than the construction I just suggested. And that has to do with Clifford circuits. So you can be lucky like this in some cases, but it, it's not necessary that you will. Okay, so this is the uh, result that the phase, if you don't cross, cross the phase transition, you can, you can still reproduce it. Okay, so let me just recap this part. The context is that you want to design answers for variational quantum algorithms that hopefully have some analytical foundation to them. And then the idea would be that you have this hierarchical parent-child construction where you, uh, in principle, can cover entire Hilbert space, but you can have a smaller order version of this answers that doesn't. Um, and then um, uh, it's, uh, this construction is given first by this iterative procedure I told you with this induction proof, and then the second is this hierarchical reduction with many body perturbation theory. And then uh, numerically, you can show that the stain inside the phase in, on the phase diagram is useful for this. So, and uh, yeah, you can check more in uh, this paper, Diagrammatic Approach to Variational Quantum Answers Construction. 
and also in the thesis by uh, Tobias Gobel, who was a bachelor student in 2020, and I supervised him, and that we uh, investigated more on this kind of uh, relation between phase diagrams and this kind of uh, comparison of different ancestors, and you can read the, more in the thesis. Okay. So I want to finish with this part. Are there any questions to this part about the answers? So you're not using the integrability of the Hamilton as the possible integrability? Uh, no, I'm not. It's not integrable, but it's uh, approximable uh, in terms of its perturbative. Yeah. So you're saying that sort of numerically, you see that as long as you're in the same phase, mm -hmm. your, your ansatz converges well. Does that mean that you're maybe sort of I mean, it's a slightly mean question. Does that mean you're looking at it wrong? Like that you should really be thinking of um, like some sort of renormalization group argument to prove that your ansatz converse as opposed to a perturbation theory argument? Oh yes, that was actually the that was actually the hope. I don't think it's mean at all because it's kind of it was kind of the inspiration because I don't know. Physically, you're used to thinking that everything that stays inside the same phase is uh, somehow secretly the same in some way, in some sense. And uh, I actually tried to prove this via something that would be a, an incarnation of renormalization group for circuits that is called flow equations. I think this is the most close, the closest thing here. The problem with flow equations, however, is that uh, you get, um, it, it's not really stable. It produces really uh, long gates. Like, in, in, like basically you would get immediately uh, a recommendation to have uh, very large gates at, at some small angle, something like this. But it, it would be like a really nice sophisticated twist to this, but I just haven't gotten this to work in a stable manner. But this would be, yeah, but this would be super cool because this would then just, I mean, th this would be very powerful, I think, if it, if it was possible. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Okay, digital quantum cooling. So, uh, yes, I mean, as we just all know from daily experience, uh, things uh, like basically systems, they go to low energies because of because they lose energy to the environment, right? You can put things in the fridge and then the fridge does that for you. But in principle, in nature, systems occur in their ground states and we somehow care about ground state preparation, right? But why? Because these systems in nature, they tend to lose energy to their environment. And this is just a natural process that we can maybe get inspired by and use in our state preparation protocols. And uh, so on, in, the, on the very broad ter in the very broad uh, terms, you just have to have, okay, you have, you have a system, but you have to have something like a fridge that is interacting with the system and is constantly releasing energy and information to the environment in a controlled manner such that the system gradually loses, uh, lo loses energy. And in, in the sense of losing information, more so, strictly speaking, it can lose entropy, right? If it goes to the ground state, then you have zero uh, von Neumann entropy, even though you can, could have started from any target state, from any starting state. So this is um, quite an interesting, uh, powerful technique if you think about it from this kind of, how can I apply this? Because it's quite different to what most people do in terms of uh, kind of ground state preparation. Okay, so uh, what would be a more precise way of looking at this and how can we ensure this in this kind of more controlled uh, context of digital quantum hardware? I think the, the best point of inspiration is actually, um, is actually spontaneous emission because this would be like an elementary process that uh, allows you to uh, reduce the energy of the system uh, via some just a single process, single interaction with a single entity that is in this case, uh, electromagnetic field. So what I'm talking about is the emission of a photon, the emission of a quantum flight that happens when the electron in whatever system, like an atom, uh, goes, um, uh, goes from some energy level to a lower energy level. And this happens spontaneously because in principle, there is electromagnetic field available and electrons interact with that, you want it or no. And if there is energy, if there is some place available at lower energies, then electrons will jump there and will emit a photon. And then the photon will go out there to the environment and you will never see it again, unless you do something like a laser where you would have like free, uh, well, you have uh, mirrors that kind of uh, keep it inside and then you use you reuse it to emit a lot of photons. But in principle, 
uh, this is the way many things cool down, especially if you put something in out in outer space, then in outer space, things will cool down because they will lose energy to the electromagnetic field, essentially. That, that will be the, the, big, the biggest contribution. So, uh, and this happens via spontaneous in, emission. And this is entirely, I would say, a non-equilibrium uh, point. This is not thermodynamics where you have to think about entropies and temperatures and everything. This is something you can think of in terms of on, on the level of kind of pu even pure states and what happens to those pure states. So uh, the main point here is conservation of energy. So I want to say that, OK, you need to be able to remove this energy. And the electromagnetic field does that for you if you do it. Uh, if you look at this natural setting, that's OK. And in digital setting, you will have to do it by hand. But then the reason why you cool down uh, to lower energies why you reduce the energy is because the total energy is conserved and you somehow uh, have transferred part of the energy to the to the other part of the system uh, to this to the bath in this case and because the total energy is conserved your energy is diminished on the one side so this is let's say if you take apart what cooling is this is i think the most uh, important basic fact about uh, what about what's happening it's the conservation of energy that is at heart of of, of this of this process okay so this is let's say this kind of uh, 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 basic uh, physics uh, that that one needs to somehow reproduce in the computation, and uh, uh, let's look at the single uh, at the example of cooling a single qubit uh, in this kind of digital manner, and uh, basically you have to think of something like a single qubit hem uh, single qubit uh, Hamiltonian which interacts. This is not. Uh, this is a bit misleading here. It's single qubit uh, Hamiltonian that you have as a system Hamiltonian, but your fridge is now also an additional qubit. And uh, you can notice here that I choose specifically the same coefficient in terms of the system and the fridge, because I need to have this conservation of energy in place. I need to be able to transfer the, to transfer the quantum of energy from the system uh, to the fridge. So this would be the expectation that you have, let's say, on the physical ground. But then you want to really look at how this would uh, be reproduced in the, in the quantum simulation of, let's say, this cooling process. And this would be this simple trotterized evolution. That, that, that's what the most natural thing that you would be able to do on, say, on a quantum device. And so of course, just to, just to be sure, the um, fridge is also just, I can think of it as a single qubit. It's it is a single qubit. It is a single qubit, and for the rest of the talk, the fridge will always be a single qubit, mm -hmm. because that's the let's say the high the thing that you have the most control over, right? If you want to do something uh, with the fridge, then then yeah, single qubit is the way to go, which of course is quite opposite from the limit of electromagnetic field with its vacuum, etc. So you have to do quite different things, but still you have to somehow respect the principle. Okay, so the trotterized evolution. Uh, would be ap approximately this. You would just do this kind of, you would split it into separate evolutions with separate poly terms, then these can be digitally simulated quite comfortably. Uh, and then you need to repeat this m times with this kind of smaller time steps in between. And then this will approximate the evolution, uh, the, the total evolution. And um, you also need, uh, to do, need to do it in cycles. Uh, in between and in between those cycles, you want to reset your fridge qubit because if energy somehow got out of the system qubit, you can initialize the fridge qubit in its ground state. But then, if the energy got out from the system qubit to the fridge qubit, you want to extract it as fast as possible. And so, you need in between this kind of fridge cycles, uh, the sorry, the reset cycles, which would uh, stand for this uh, kind of photon get lo getting lost in space or somehow this kind of extraction of energy. Okay, and then there are, of course, differences with spontaneous emission. For example, um, if you like look at this picture, uh, let's first talk about the upper uh, upper panel, which says continuous. And this is in the case where you don't have any trotter error whatsoever. And then you see that actually the transition from one to zero, which is the cooling transition in the system, uh, you go from state one, which is high energy to state zero, uh, then, uh, this probability will actually oscillate in time. And this is because you have this finite system interacting. And this, this will actually be an oscillatory behavior, uh, oscillatory behavior rather than like a just a growing behavior, a growing probability, exponentially growing probability, let's say, or exponentially decreasing probability of, not, of this not happening um, uh, if, you in, if you talk about spontaneous emission. So somehow it's for, for this reason, we actually want to catch a moment when this probability is the highest. So this is kind of an interesting part of this. And uh, when this probability is the highest. 
And then the, uh, there is also a probability of reheating from zero to one, because again, you're dealing with a finite system and you're also doing things at, for finite time. So there is essentially an energy uncertainty that may cause you to uh, oscillate back. And then there are trotter errors, which make it even worse. So if you go, if you go down and if you have a very high, a very, let's say crude trotter expansion, then um, the, uh, the point where the trotter expansion uh, becomes more or less exact, it does shift to the right as you go up, but you cannot just use some, let's say, very crude trotter expansion. So this is not really even a, uh, this can be somehow used. You can try to use it in a NISC way, but to make it a useful NISC algorithm, you have to do extra work. And instead we actually focus on thinking how would you do it if you would, if you would be able to do actually long time evolutions. So that would be the subject here. Okay, and you can suppress indeed this uh, reheating probability if you actually go to the smaller system uh, fridge coupling, which is this kind of small coupling limit. Okay, so this was a lot, but this is okay. So this is just simple example of single qubit where you have the, all the control in the world. And then if you have a larger system, then uh, you need to think about the following. Okay, you have many energy levels in, the, in your system going from E0 to EN where E0 would be, let's say the ground state. And this would be your spectrum of the system if your bath was just in a state with no energy whatsoever. But then uh, you can compare this to the state uh, where uh, you also have energy in some state epsilon uh, to, to the spectrum. And then the spectrum gets this continuous element if you're, the spectrum of your bath was continuous, they had this epsilon as a continuous variable, then you would have in principle the possibility to hit a resonance and because you have this conservation of energy, uh, move this exact quantum of energy from this system uh, to, uh, to, the, to the bath. And this way, this can be represented in this comparison between these two spectra, because you can have basically a resonance between a state where there is no photon, right, where there's zero energy in the bath, and the state where there is a photon, but now it's but now the system itself it is in the ground state. So we already just have a ground state here, and this resonance is the thing that you're playing with when you when you perform this cooling, and you can extract this way. You can go from here to here, and that's that would be the cooling process. But because we have a qubit, we do not have the access to this kind of infinite uh, this this continuous spectrum bath. So instead, we actually have to probe multiple energies, and because we cannot probe all of the energies, we can actually we actually have to use the fact that we have this energy uncertainty and not probe uh, the exact energies, but energies with some widths, so to say, uh, by actually performing a time dependent evolution rather than this kind of evolution where energy conservation is exact. So somehow you need to break energy conservation a little bit to be able to uh, increase the, to, to be able to reproduce this continuous path uh, with a single qubit. So this is an interesting, an interesting point. Okay, so, and then the challenges are matching these energy levels and the energy uncertainty, which is both a challenge and an asset that you have, and you have to play with those. Okay, so uh, analytically treating this is quite hard. Jumping ahead, I mean, you can try and model this quantum cooling process as a classical Markov process, ignoring all of the coherences that occur uh, in, uh, in, in between the energy eigenstates as you go along. And uh, then you can make, let's say, th theorem and proof kind of statements uh, for this being scalable and good and etc. Uh, but then, of course, you need to apply it in practice. And again, if you apply it to transverse field Ising model, then you have still quite some promising results. And the promising results are A, that, okay, so you have letter K, that is a key uh, variable here. And that's the number of energies you actually probe in the spectrum. You don't, cannot probe all the energies, you probe K energies. And if K, is K, if K uh, grows, then you get uh, actually uh, increasing uh, ground state fidelity that seems to algebraically scale to uh, algebraically scale to one. So this is good news that we have this kind of algebraic thing uh, going on. But this is, of course, you see it's dependent, highly dependent on system, uh, on, on the coupling in the system. And I remind you that this letter J here is the coupling inside the transfer serializing model, which corresponds to this many body element. Okay, so, but at least it seems to be algebraic. We don't, cannot, we do not know uh, what exactly, but numerics seem to suggest this. Uh, and, uh, and then also in a different, a different question is how does this scale with the system size? And the system size, uh, the issue about the system size is that, okay, um, 
yeah, you want this to be scalable if you go to larger to larger n, obviously. And the uh, result is that the relative error in the energy of the ground state that you prepare uh, for a fixed k, you fix k at some at some particular number here. I think it was five or six, and uh, then uh, the energy the error actually stays flat in these particular two regimes, which are the paramagnetic regime. It's kind of a trivial regime and the critical regime, which is pretty non-trivial. But then this error diverges if you go to the ferromagnetic regime. And uh, this has to do with uh, things like topological defects, which I cannot go into right now. So uh, so it can it can be, let's say, explained slash explained the way uh, why you have this kind of divergence. But there are clearly exceptions to the rule. And this kind of has to do, I mean, this topological defect business is already going a little bit in the direction of this kind of NP completeness problems that you would have with classical uh, Ising systems even. Then uh, th this kind of makes sense that you already have uh, problems with uh, with scalability here. So, okay, so it seems to make sense in practice. And if you model it with a Markov process, then you can prove things as well. Okay, so let me recap uh, in nature. Cooling, of course, is the way that systems go to their ground states or at least the low energy states. Uh, on digital hardware, you cannot reproduce the entire bath uh, if you want it to be a controlled algorithm, but instead you can use a single qubit. And then the challenges are that you need to man match the energies and uh, uh, of the of the system so that you have these resonances and the energy conservation that helps you to reduce the energy, and you have totalization and uncertainty to play with. And uh, also, it seems to scale reasonably for at least some many body systems. And uh, this is based both on an analytical approximation as a classical Markov process and also on the numerics with transfer serializing model. And I want to thank here especially Stefan Opola, who was then a master's student at the time. And he did a lot of work, especially on the numerical side, to make this really a great work. And uh, I was uh, just uh, supervising him, but he did really the 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 hard uh, the, the hard the hard job here. Yeah. Okay, so let me then uh, skip to this uh, measurement. Okay, are there any questions uh, before I go on? Yeah. Hey, hey, Yaroslav, can, can I ask a oh, question? Hi, hi, Michael. Um, uh, what if you used more than one qubit uh, for the fridge? Uh, would that help you? Like, how would things scale? Would it be more robust, or you have less fine tuning required? Or? I mean, an obvious point is that um, we here actually we don't just um, couple the system to the fridge uh, at uh, different energies, but we also do it in different places because there are actually bounds on how well can you cool if you just stick to one place. I mean, there are restrictions on that. So if you use just a single qubit, let's say in the, in the very practical terms, then it's a little bit, uh, I mean, why not just use n qubits? Like basically you have a fridge qubit for every system qubit, right? So that's just a clear trivial practical remark. Um, then uh, on top of this, if you want to use uh, a, a, a larger system, then also a, a bit of less trivial remark is that probably you want to have continuous spectrum in your fridge after all. If you want to have a continuous spectrum, then uh, the chances are that you actually want something like a critical system as your fridge. Okay, so this now becomes a non-trivial matter, especially if you want to treat this analytically, you have a critical system coupled to, the, to, the, to, to your target system and uh, you, might lose some control but again here the nice thing is that you try to really run of these fundamental principles like energy conservation and they'll they'll help you along the way to kind of ensure that you will not uh, somehow get stuck uh, in and, and never never cool for example you also have to break symmetries but that's a, that's not what you asked about so yeah you can you can go to larger systems you can just have more free each qubits Yes, but uh, but you have less uh, less control. It becomes a bit less trivial, but uh, it's definitely interesting. Thanks. Thanks. So. Any further questions? Okay. Okay. So uh, then let me go on to this measurement driven navigation thing. So it's a little bit of a. Um, probably enigmatic, the, this just uh, so, sounds like a, some just word that doesn't mean anything. So let me uh, explain to you exactly what this, uh, what this is about. So we want to prepare some many body target states 
with uh, weak measurements essentially and more precisely let's assume we have some n qubits that could for example in physics language would be spin one or spin one half degrees of freedom and the goal would be to prepare some resourceful interesting target states and we would deal like in the paper we deal with things like uh, graph states like ult states and w, w state from a more trivial and mundane let's say a product or a fully mixed state and uh, the you have it again the detector uh, instead of a fridge you have something like a detector it's just one qubit initialized again in zero and then it's a weak measurement because you apply system detector coupling for some short time period and then you measure the detector immediately which means that in in most, most likely in the yeah in basically most likely uh, you will not even change the state of the detector after this short time evolution if the Hamiltonian just has a reasonable norm, as it were. And uh, uh, most likely you also didn't do much to your system. Or on the other hand, you have a small probability to maybe do something dramatic to your system. So this is this particular type of weak measurement. And there is, of course, a whole classification of what kind of what you call this kind of weak measurement. But uh, this is the specific thing we're looking at. So also some disclaimer I want to say immediately. Uh, we don't want to tackle quantum advantage regime here. It's we assume we have access even to a classical simulation of the entire evolution. But then the question will be, can we choose the system detector couplings to speed it up, even if we have that access, because it's still a very hard problem. So then again, the protocol would be just running in the cycles in cycles of this form. You prepare the detector in the zero state. You select the system detector coupling. So the, you have to perform the selection procedure and perform this evolution. Then you measure detector in the Z basis. And then you decide whether you continue the run or you stop to have a good enough precision to your target state. And because you have access to your, uh, to your evolution, you know when the precision is good enough. So that is also, that problem is not exactly, like we will know when we are, we are there, but the problem is getting there and getting there quickly. So um, how to actively select for this uh, system detector coupling is the question because we get information from the measurement. We, we, we get information from the, from the detector all the time. Can we use it to speed the process up and how, how much can we speed it up? So that's the question. And if you like diagrams more than text, then there you are. I'm not sure if, uh, yeah, that may help you. Basically we run in these cycles and we have some kind of classical control unit that stores the information about the readouts. And uh, we have, uh, let's say then also the notion of a click or no click. And the click is this rare event that happens when your detector goes from zero to one. And that may dramatically change the state or no click is the, when you just have a small nudge to the state and the detector didn't change its state. Uh, what I mean, you have a small nudge to the system state, but the detector uh, didn't change its state either. So this is just the result of the fact that we have this sm small time evolution here. Okay, so this is the basic setup and the question, can we uh, come up with some approaches to speed it up by active selection, as opposed to uh, just choosing some pre-selected uh, set of system detector Hamiltonians and just looping over it uh, and get into this uh, target state as the dark state of this dissipative evolution. Okay, so one approach uh, is the uh, quantum state of, uh, quantum state machine that would be, let's say, a quantum version of a finite state machine in a very particular sense that I will describe to you in, in, in a second. Um, basically, you want to reproduce the possible actions of your Hamiltonians that are available to you uh, in this uh, in this evolution or in this protocol, you want to reproduce you want to represent them as uh, uh, in total as a multicolored uh, sorry is a colored multigraph, uh, and you would have vertices representing states in the Hilbert space, and you would have arrows representing the transitions. Uh, you would have a weighted actually complex weighted arrows that represent the transitions. Uh, that are generated by uh, a specific system detector Hamiltonian in a specific scenario, whether you change the detector where you received zero or one in the detector. Okay, so that's click or no click. So you have the solid lines, you see it can be a dramatic change, you can go from zero to one in this particular example. Uh, that would be a click scenario or in the no click scenario almost don't change anything you just return to the same state maybe with a bit of a different weight that would repre that would represent the probability of the doing this so it's a little there are some quite some technical details behind this but i just want to get you wanted to get kind of the rough picture here and um, 
here's just an example of a three level system with these two interaction Hamiltonians that have this specific manner. And here immediately you can tell how you would coordinate these two specific couplings. If we would not, if you would do it passively, you would just loop over these two, uh, you would just loop over these two Hamiltonians. And at some point uh, you will receive a click in the detector with some probability you go from zero to one. And at some point you will run the second Hamiltonian uh, and then you will also be like, you go from one to two and you will have some expected time of this, of this, uh, of this protocol uh, that in which this protocol will run. And, um, here, uh, of course, you can speed it up uh, by a factor of two, uh, trivially by only applying the first Hamiltonian first and the second Hamiltonian second. Okay, so this is a, just a very simple example of how you can speed this up uh, if you uh, do this uh, representation and just treat it as a classical graph exploration problem. Okay. <laughs> now this is a bit of more complicated diagram and this is what happens if you go to a w state preparation just on three qubits okay you have eight states and uh, if you uh, if you choose to prepare your target state your w state from let's say all down state and the w state is is this here this thing here uh, then if you choose to do so uh, with a coupling that couples your a detector with the entire system. So it will be like a four body coupling, a general four body coupling. Um, then you can do it basically without, without any shenanigans. You can go, just go directly. You can design a very artificial coupling that will do this for you. But uh, if you at least have some, let's say reasonable constraint that would be, let's say uh, more physical or uh, practical uh, that you cannot couple to the entire system, but you can only couple to two spins at a time. So, which means that the entire Hamiltonian, rather than being a four local Hamiltonian, is let's say a three local Hamiltonian, one standing for the detector and two standing for the system. You cannot go lower than that, otherwise you will not have entanglement. There are like issues that like many constraints and kind of uh, formal statements you can make here. Um, so you need at least couple to two spins at a time with uh, your detector. Uh, but if you do uh, it and it becomes interesting and you will need uh, these couplings essentially all of them to be able to prepare the target state if you don't make any if you don't uh, do any dec active decision making if you just perform this passively and not don't look at your measurement outcomes and not use the measurement outcomes and then if you do this quantum state machine representation then it becomes kind of clear that um, it's um, and again, it's it's actually a toy example when you think about it. It's not so it's not so difficult. In the entire Hilbert space, it's kind of difficult. But then you have to perform something called semi-classical coarse graining of this quantum state machine that we designed, uh, that is needed such, uh, to not, never have superpositions or interferences in your in you in this in this network that uh, that we work with here. So basically. Um, uh, this will again turn it into a classical graph exploration problem, and we know how to treat classical graph exploration problems. So in this case, uh, you would coarse grain things into the subspaces uh, marked by the number of excitations in your state, and uh, then the, this this becomes this coarse grained network, which is much simpler. This uh, state machine. And then you can just explore it. It becomes kind of trivial. You start here, then okay, you don't need to apply all of the couplings. You just apply one coupling, the, the number one, and then you apply the one of the green couplings before you before you inside the subspace you finally reach your target state. Okay, so this would be the heuristic here, uh, and uh, it works. And uh, not so surprisingly, because if you don't do, I mean, it gives you a massive advantage and it's not so surprising because if you don't look at your measurement outcomes and just passively perform all of these uh, couplings one after another, then you will get to the target state at some point, but it will be quite slow because for example, you may have two clicks from the blue line and you will overshoot and you go to the state two, and then you will need a red, uh, to go uh, along the red line at some point. And then, and then all of this involves chance and luck and uh, who knows when it happens. And uh, this leads to these two very uh, different histograms in the measurement, in, in the outcomes, how long did the protocol take? And the total runtime for passive protocol, you see is distributed quite widely. And this is a logarithmic, uh, logarithmic histogram up to 15,000 steps, while an active protocol is basically, it, it runs much faster. And the typical trajectory is also, of course, uh, a little bit comic, I guess, because you in the passive protocol, you just loop over. If you never use inform any information, you just have to 
keep looping over and then at some point you will reach the target state while well, an active protocol you just go directly there okay so this is this simple example and this works when you have relatively simple states where you can reproduce this as uh, this kind of uh, just this quantum state machine networks so that that will be kind of if you want to produce some simple state but if you want to produce some harder state then it's uh, it becomes harder to even design these couplings that would uh, get you to the uh, target state the ground state uh, and on top of that it's also hard to somehow coordinate them in a meaningful way because producing these uh, exponentially large graphs is probably not the way to go so the second approach is a bit more uh, uh, simple and robust on the side of optimization and a bit uh, more interesting, I guess, on the side of uh, actually designing these couplings that will get you to target state. So you can uh, use for larger target states uh, often or sometimes if they have limited entanglement, they have good so-called parent instances. And the simple example is AKLT state which is the ground state of this uh, of this AKLT Hamiltonian. And it's a parent, uh, sorry, parent Hamiltonian. I wanted, I, I said parent answers, parent Hamiltonians. Uh, and this is a parent Hamiltonian for, uh, for the AKLT state. And it's parent Hamiltonian meaning that uh, it's individual terms, they do not even commute with each other. And uh, as a result, this AKLT state is an entangled state. However, it is actually the ground state of each of these separate terms individually. And this has to do with the fact that the ground space of each of these terms individually is actually degenerate. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. Um, then you can actually um, use the system detector Hamiltonians that couple only to two neighboring spins at the same time. Uh, that navigate to this ground space of each separate uh, Hamiltonian that is kind of trivial to design if you allow for just an arbitrary coupling that uh, that couples the, the detector to uh, the subsystem of two spins. And this, by the way, um, yeah, I mean, it's written, but I did not emphasize, I guess, enough. Uh, it's a spin one uh, Hamiltonian, it means it's a Q-treat Q uh, Q model. So this S is would be a yeah, spin uh, operator on the Q-treat. Okay, so the, <laughs> the, the, the SL2 uh, represent, uh, represented in three-dimensional space. Uh, so basically, um, you have this uh, selection of system detector Hamiltonians. Uh, and uh, you want to choose from them, between them, as you run along this protocol. And in principle, they can prepare the state in a passive cycle. You just choose one such Hamiltonian for every pair of spins. And, uh, and then the, they will navigate to the ground space of, to the ground space of this, each of this Hamiltonian. And uh, there are actually formal statements in the literature uh, in some related contexts where it's proven that it's enough to have this a similar protocol that would be a different context uh, that would get you to, a, uh, uh, to the, this uh, common ground state if you just uh, keep, uh, keep dissipating to this ground space. But does active choice for this Hamiltonian speed it up? And uh, it's too hard to use quantum state machine, like I said. And instead, let's just greedily optimize expected overlap to the target state. And that would be our cost function. So this is like a very practical uh, approach. And let's just see how it works. It works well. And uh, there are some mysteries involved and questions. Uh, for example, uh, the speed up factor seems to grow with the system size. It goes up to 10 for uh, system size six. And if you, if I would do a bit, uh, let's say, a bit more sophisticated uh, numerical technique, I would probably can go to, I don't know, seven or eight uh, to, sim to simulate this efficiently. Uh, but uh, at least the factor of 10 can be achieved if you go to this kind of uh, semi like intermediate system sizes. And here's also the histogram. It, uh, this is a histogram for n equals five. So yeah, you have basically advantage from this kind of active decision making, uh, where you choose uh, each Hamiltonian based on the measurement outcome. Okay, so as a recap, yeah, weak measurements with active feedback can be used to efficiently navigate Hilbert space. And I say navigate because basically if you if you don't use such simple heuristics and you try to just brute forcely solve this, for example, there are techniques involved in dynamical programming that allow you to have a precisely best uh, strategy to do this, but they are kind of doubly exponential in the system size and time, and they are just uh, a bit a bit awful to work with. 
Uh, but uh, if you come up with this kind of heuristic that allow you to navigate uh, in some approximately efficient manner, then you can get advantage from for preparing uh, some entangled uh, target states. And uh, yeah, so this is the point here. Okay, so you can read more if you want. And uh, are there any questions on this part, the final, semi-final part? Okay. So how strongly sort of state dependent is the complexity of these uh, state machines? Is there any way to quantify this? Um, uh, not really. I mean, basically it is state dependent. It's, it's even basis dependent because you somehow choose these basis states specifically and you even have to find the right basis to write it in. So it's a really, if you try to treat it kind of rigorously, it very quickly becomes a very hard problem. So we kind of do more practical way uh, of doing this. And uh, yeah, you can think of, let's say, simple cases, cases of simple states and try to understand how that works. Uh, and try to make some conclusions, but it's yeah, it's quite hard to see this uh, system dependence and how it works. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So um, yeah, I want to just tell you about one ongoing project that I have. Please don't uh, share it. Uh, okay, it will, be on, it will be on YouTube. Hopefully, not too many people will see it. And uh, and uh, and what's next? Uh, especially if it so happens that I work with uh, with uh, people uh, at QSoft. So okay, so basically, one ongoing project that I have is something I called quantum circuit perturbation theory. And this is actually quite quantum information thing in the sense that it doesn't, it's not really physics informed all that much. Uh, it's just employing Taylor series and then Clifford similability to classically approximate relatively arbitrary quantum circuit, meaning any quantum circuit that's generated by rotations with polystrings. And the key insight is that, of course, as you all know, uh, this exponential for polystring P is a Clifford gate if theta is proportional to pi over four with integer coefficient. So, okay, so this is true, but then what you can try and do is um, it's kind of similar to a lot of this uh, kind of Clifford, uh, uh, Clifford business where you would uh, actually expand uh, in the perturbations which are the magic gates, but here it's entirely uh, different still because you instead of uh, perturbing in the magic gates you actually perturb in the value of the angle that is a perturbation uh, relative to this Clifford point as it were where all the angles are pi over four so you take this phi i that is a difference between the actual angle and the integer times pi over four this uh, perturbation angle is always smaller than pi over eight if it's a very small angle then I mean, I guess the Solovey construction will give you the pretty uh, complicated circuit, but here actually you're happy with this because Taylor series will converge quite well. So this is one of the kind of differences you immediately notice. And um, the expansion to uh, any finite order is polynomially hard because of Clifford similability in particular, in if you take the circuit and measure the in the variational style, the energy output of this, then it will be a, uh, uh, a polynomially hard uh, problem to solve, uh, basically a polynomially hard algorithm to basically just write down this approximate energy as a function of these angles. And in, in the variational algorithm, this can be used just very practically to have a classically optimized initialization of these parameters. And then when, what I mean by initialization is that it will be classically optimal from the point of view of this approximation, but then you can use this as initial point for the quantum uh, for the quantum evolution in the, for quantum algorithm, which is the variation of quantum algorithm. Uh, it's a very interesting question how this approximation breaks because this uh, seems to go quite at least the claim or the method seems to go quite beyond the variational quantum algorithm applications. You can just take basically any uh, poorly generated circuit and try to approximate it this way. It seems to be different from anything that I have seen so far. And uh, how exactly it fails, because it has to fail at some point is a little bit of a mystery to me at the moment. And I just take this uh, practical approach in the variational quantum algorithm context, and it seems to give quite good results. So I'm happy and uh, hopefully we'll soon wrap this up. 
So, and this is done in collaboration with, uh, again, with Tobias Gobel, who was a uh, bachelor student in Leiden and now is a master student in, at Amsterdam. Okay, so, and what's next? The possible directions that I see for myself, especially in the context of possibly working uh, at QSoft, is uh, to work um, on, to continue working on NISC state preparation with even a better grip on, let's say, a uh, provable methods that allow you to uh, kind of basically tell, okay, indeed, this state preparation routine can be run in NISC, and at the same time, hopefully it even offers some advantage. That would be the best case scenario, because right now we don't really have many algorithms or any algorithms that are NISC, but actually give you anything like quantum speed up from any rigorous point of view. And then um, identify the role of errors, which is something I have not done all that much so far. And then there are all these kinds of questions. And also there is a lot of mathematical depth to it that I'm looking forward to, to, to investigate. And um, also it was quite interesting. I had some ideas to how to interface maybe with complexity theory uh, or even quantum communication. But for example, with complexity theory, uh, one could try and uh, it will not even be necessarily a very hard task, but try to kind of um, a little bit twist and bend the existing BQP completeness statements that would, uh, such that the resulting statement would be much closer to what we have right now in the in the NISC practice. For example, like one of the recent things is that people often do a Fouquet simulation. And this is something that is just much more practical on NISC devices. But this is somehow, uh, this is one of the things that in the complexity literature is kind of overlooked because it's kind of a specific, maybe it's almost like a specific case of what was already proven. Uh, maybe it's not, but it's kind of just, uh, it, it, there are new problems that come from the NISC direction, let's say, uh, that need some rigor, I think. Okay, thank you.